one, two.
I am the resurrection and the life, says the Lord. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. The hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. We brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we shall carry nothing out. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Our Savior Christ Jesus abolished death and brought to life and immortality to light through the gospel. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and of hell. Because I live, you will live also. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain. For the first things are passed away.
Kindly be seated. Let us go to God in prayer. Most gracious God, we turn to you in the sorrow and grief of our bereavement, praying that we may find the strength we need in your sustaining grace, so that even as we mourn the death of one whom we knew and loved, we may not be overcome by this trial, but we may hold fast, trusting in your goodness and mercy. Assure us, O Lord our God, that death is not the end of those who trust in you. And may our hearts be so composed in the Holy Spirit that all fear and bitterness may be swallowed up in the light and peace you give to your troubled children through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty and eternal God, who by the Holy Spirit minister to us in our weakness, and by the victory of your Son, Jesus Christ, have given us the pledge of eternal life. Lift us, we pray, above our present distress and sorrow, and shed the light of your grace and glory upon us, through Jesus Christ the same, our Lord and Savior. Amen and Amen. We are met in this solemn moment to commend Hartley MacDonald Ford into the hands of the Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who sent his Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Redeemer, by whose stripes we are healed, and in whose name alone we have salvation. Let us then recall to mind the life of our deceased brother in humble trust as we hear the words of the eulogy delivered by Patrick Ford. morning. Abraham Lincoln said, in the end, it is not the years in your life that count, it is the life in your years. This morning we gather to celebrate Hartley Ford and his 94 years of living and to bid farewell to that which was mortal. He was the last surviving of six siblings and his passing represents for all of us the end of an era. Hartley arrived as the second of a twin born to Darnell and Ione Ford on April 4th, 1928, the other twin being Orville. The birth of these two boys was momentous in that it signaled for my grandparents a change in their fortune the first of their offspring to survive. In case you don't know the family history, my grandmother gave birth to 13 children. The first seven died. The twin was the first to live. Hartley was a part of that twin. They were followed by another boy, Gray, and then three girls, Euline, Clarine, and Nola. The six of them formed an unusual group of siblings who never had a bad thing to say about each other. They were fiercely loyal and never competed with each other. You ask, how is this possible? I've con come to the conclusion. My grandparents, Darnell and Ion, must have loved their children all equally and poured out the love of 13 children onto the six that survived. Winston Churchill said, there is no doubt that it is around the family and the home that all the greatest virtues are created, strengthened, and maintained. This home of love and faith became the foundation upon which Hartley built his life. 
He was essentially a family man, committed not only to his wife and his sons, but to the large extended family of which he was the de facto patriarch, a role in which he relished. To those of his nephews and nieces who have already lost one or both of our parents, he functioned as a substitute father. But it did not end there. His understanding of family was wide and inclusive, encompassing his in-laws, grandchildren, great nieces and nephews, a multitude of cousins, neighbors, and of course, his friends. His heart of love was capable of extending itself to all. He took on the role in his family as the oldest brother, even though he was not. How did this come to pass? He was certainly the more, out, the more outgoing of the twin brothers, or maybe it came to be because Orville, living in England, could not adequately perform that role of big brother being an ocean away. Hartley stepped into the void, and this was to be a pattern in his life, filling in the gaps in people's lives and in the community. If he saw a need that was going unfulfilled, he would do what was necessary to fill it. My brother and I experienced his willingness to fill the needed roles in a person's life when our father was studying in the UK and Uncle Hartley became a substitute dad for us. Whenever daddy was traveling on, on church or government business, he would always say, if you need such and such, before I get back, you can always ask your uncle. His love also express, pre expressed itself as protection backed up by fearlessness and physical strength. Keeping the people around him safe was important to him, and he did not like to see anyone unfairly treated. We have all heard or witnessed him rushing into the fray to rescue someone in distress. He was a consummate big brother. When Hartley completed his, secretary, his secondary education at the Allen School, he opted to go into the teaching service, starting out in the parish of St. Joseph. He then taught for a number of years at St. Simon's until the Ford family relocated to Black Rock St. Michael. As many of you know, Hartley was a man of action who loved working with his hands. He was also very artistic. In fact, do you know when he and Yvonne met, they were attending an art class? He had many hobbies that reflected his creative side pottery, photography, auto body repair, gardening, sewing, and flower arranging. Yes, I said flower arranging. He would put together little bouquets of flowers from a garden at the house, little known fact. Some of those hobbies turned into jobs, like the position he held at the audiovisual aids department where his skills in photography were utilized. Eventually, Hartley decided to specialize in industrial arts and pursued a course of study at Shoreditch College in England, training in this area. Some after, sometime after that, he would land a job as the industrial arts teacher at Ellerslie Secondary School, where he retired as the head of that department in 1988. Hartley was a strict teacher who believed in the verse, spare the rod, spoil the child, and was infamous among Ellerslie alumni for this. However, he was also committed to the success of the students at the school and would once again go above the call of duty to pull wayward children back from the brink. He was a guidance counselor before the job was officially invented. On many occasions, the principal of Ellerslie would consult with Hartley when the staff was dealing with a difficult situation involving a student and he always had a solution. And there's many stories that we have about Hartley, and I don't have time to go into all of them. But I will tell this particular one that he told me on one of my visits back home to Barbados. When he was at Ellerslie School, a lot of the kids would be playing football and other things, probably mostly the boys, and would damage their shoes. So they would come back from lunchtime and the shoes would be all busted up. And Hartley decided to learn how to repair shoes and to get the equipment for shoe repair so any of, the t any of his students who kind of uh, busted up their shoes and, and damaged them, he would just repair them. So after H Hartley um, retired, the kids went to the headmaster and said, when are you bringing the shoe repair person back to the school? 
and the principal said there's no such thing as a shoe repair person at Ellerslie. Hartley had filled in the gap just based on the need that, that he saw that had to be done. Oprah Winfrey said, you know you are on the road to success if you would do your job and not be paid for it. Hartley did many things in work and life that would be impossible to reward monetarily. For many men, retirement can present a challenge. Who am I now? I no longer have a job to define me. What am I going to do with all the time on my hands? Hartley never missed a beat. He threw himself into a succession of projects and hobbies. Retirement meant the freedom to indulge, really indulge his creativity. Hartley has always loved the land, whether he was planting flowers around the house or tilling the land in Morgan Lewis. He and Daddy bought some land in Morgan Lewis in the 1970s and decided to try their hand at subsistence farming. The important word here is try. <laughs> Many a weekend was wasted, sorry, spent planting canes or yams or some other ground provision. Of course, Philip and I went along for the adventure, pretending that the hills of Morgan Lewis were a deserted island. Eventually, Daddy gave up the dream of becoming a farmer and rented out his two acres. Not Hartley. He continued working that land well into his 80s, I think. Someone in the family finally convinced him that it was not good for him to drive all the way down to Morgan Lewis and be in the ground alone in case something should happen to him. And I think finally he gave up doing that. It is hard to talk about Hartley's love of the land without me spending a little time on what I would like to call the cane juice years. <laughs> he was convinced that cane juice was the nectar of the gods and ground his way into fame. He sold it on any occasion he could, which included the whole town and Oyston festivals and Bridgetown Market. He basically had a monopoly on that drink in Barbados. If you wanted cane juice, you had to come to Black Rock. The fact of the matter is, Hartley did not do anything for financial gain alone. He did what he did because he had a passion for it and because he thought it might help someone else. That brings me to the thing that consumed most of his later years. His good friend Gladwin described him as the man with the healing hands who had the restorative touch and soft tissue limbs and joints. He discovered this gift of massage post-retirement and as he had done many times before, lavished it on the world, availing himself to anyone who needed some extra care in recovering from an accident or a stroke. It really did not matter what the cause. He had the cure. If you gave Hartley 10 minutes, he would give you the latest list of people who were healed via his intervention. Once he told me he was driving his truck and saw an old man who was probably younger than he was, having difficulty walking at the bottom of University Hill. You know the rest of the story. He stopped the vehicle, he did a short therapy session, and the man was better than ever before. There's something very familiar about that story. I think we've all heard it, I think we've all heard it before. A man who used to stop whatever he was doing to heal people at the side of, his at the, side of the road. What was his name again? It'll come to me. There are many wholesome and positive attributes that can be ascribed to Hartley, but those that are foremost in our minds are genuine, generous, and selfless. We are all aware that his selfless nature was his hallmark. He was loving, caring, giving, always doing something for someone and sharing something with someone many times at the sacrifice of his own needs. My father always said if someone sent Hartley three shirts, he would give away two and keep one. Ali, his son, recalls as a child being in the car going to town with Hartley. Of course, Hartley had to make six stops before he arrived at his destination due to his outgoing nature and his concern for his fellow man. He brought much joy to others and made people happy. He was excellent company and people were drawn to him mostly because of his storytelling and that ever-present sense of humor. Time does not permit me to share the measure of this man. The stories are endless, the jokes are endless. We will spend the rest of our lives telling them. What he meant to us over the decades, we have had the pleasure to know him as a father, husband, 
grandfather, uncle, cousin, friend, teacher, neighbor, and healer. What is left for us, what is left is for us to preserve his legacy by doing what he did. He dreamt of a place where the practice of loving one's neighbor as oneself was commonplace, a place called paradise. May he rest in peace. Thank you. We thank you very much for that insight into who Hartley was. And I'm down here to do the homily, and really and truly, I'm not sure if I need to do that now because um, of what we've heard concerning him. His example stands there ready for us to observe and follow. Thank you, Patrick. We are continuing now, and we are going to be regaled by a solo. If I can help somebody, and I believe it is fitting, having heard of Hartley's life. And this solo is to be presented by Jane Small. Look forward to hearing Jane Small. I missed several of her presentations before. If I can help somebody as I pass along, if I can show somebody with a word or song, if I can show
Amen. Well deserving of applause. And we thank you, Jane. And we are going to follow on that lead as we stand and sing uh, Psalm 23, as printed in your booklet. seated, well sung, almost up to Jane's standard. We are now going to hear from the Word of God, the first and second Bible reading as indicated in your leaflet, and I now usher up the readers at this point, the Bible readings. The first Bible reading is taken from Romans chapter 8, verses 31 to 39. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, 
or peril or sword, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here ends the reading. The second Bible reading is taken from the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 7, and I'm reading verse 11 to 17. Soon afterward, Jesus went to the town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her and said, don't cry. Then he went up and touched the bear they were carrying him on, and the bearers stood still. He said, young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea, and the surrounding country. Here ends this morning's reading. I omitted to mention the names of the readers. Sister Debbie Ann Jemmett read the first reading, and Sister Dawn Jemmett Lowe, the second one. Thank you very much. Well read. We understood clearly what was said. We're going to continue with the singing of the hymn Amazing Grace. So let us stand and sing that together. Yeah. 
seated. I had said the homily was already done, but to tell the truth, I feel a little underwhelmed now to give you this after hearing a life well lived. But I'll go ahead nevertheless. First of all, I wish on behalf of the Reverend Arlette Waterman and myself to express our sympathy to his family, his wife, uh, Yvonne Ford, his two sons, Alastair and and Anderson, other members of the family also. I'm familiar with, Pat, with Philip and Patrick, his nephews, and I also knew him personally. And in fact, I had always planned to take one of his massage courses, but never got around to it. Now, um, Philip claims to be his protege and is now open for business. I know he's good with his fingers on the keyboard, but I'm really not sure about this massage thing. <laughs> so I have to think again concerning that. I've al always found Hartley to be an int a very interesting personality. And from the sentiments that I've heard from young Patrick, uh, I know that he would have had a very positive influence on so many during his life. And I know that he will surely be missed. You know, Funerals at Christmas time is interesting. It's actually a bit of a conundrum. For in the midst of the joy of celebrating a birth, we experience the sorrow of a death. In the midst of celebrating the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, we have the remembrance of, a, of the life of a loved one. The cycle of life and death, you may think. In fact, I looked down and heard a young baby crying, even as we are... Um, saying goodbye to an older one. After all, we are all born and will eventually pass, hopefully not too soon. And, uh, but that's a rather philosophical approach, I think, uh, which does not help much when we are grieving. Death at Christmas time has sometimes dulled the spirit of the season uh, for many years to come by many folk, several of which um, I have come across, and even though in the festivities of Christmas, it brings back memories, so it's a bit of a conundrum. Now, the gospel reading describes such an occasion <clears throat> when there was a funeral, not sure what time of the year it was, but I doubt it was Christmas, and it describes a really tragic scenario. A woman had lost her only son, and um, I'm told that mothers and sons have a special connection, and mothers and sons, uh, and firstborn sons, have an even more special connection. Now, I don't know who started that rumor. Um, I'm, I'm the firstborn of um, four others, and to tell the truth, I don't think I was treated any better um, than the rest, but they may tell you a different story. Just take my word for it and don't ask them anything. <laughs> um, so, um, she lost not only her firstborn son, but her only son. That's really tough, because quite frankly, um, uh, you, we should not have to bury our children. It should be the, op the opposite way uh, wrong. They should, bury, they should be the ones burying us. We go on to discover, um, furthermore, not only had she lost her only son, but also um, she was a widow, which meant she would have lost her husband sometime before. So I thought, whoa, what a predicament. No wonder the scriptures state that a large crowd was present, presumably to grieve with her and to strive to comfort her. We also have to understand uh, that back then it would have been a more dire situation because of the plight of women in those days. Who will look after her now? She will be at the mercy of the extended family members, and we know full well with our members that that can work well and sometimes not so well at all, or dependent, perhaps, on friends. Employment for women in those days was virtually non-existent, and in fact, um, we read in the scriptures that one of the tasks of the early church 
was to look out for the widows. So much so that one of the first points of contention <clears throat> involved the extent to which the Jewish widows, and remember Christianity started as an offshoot of Judaism, and then it came into its own, but there was a contention and suspicion that the Jewish widows were getting a little something more in the donations than the Gentile widows. The Gentile widows would be there um, who had been recently converted to Christianity, to Judaism. Uh, so you, and, and, it is, and it was so serious, the disciples had to get personally involved to start up business and appoint persons who they trust um, to ensure that equity took place. So serious were arms a necessity. So enter Jesus, and what a difference he makes. He has compassion on her and effects a great miracle out of love and compassion for her. Part of the reading um, from Romans states, who will separate us from the love of Christ? And again, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him uh, who loved us. So with Christ, we are more than conquerors. You know, and we also have the assurance of being with him in eternity. You know, when I read that, I thought, I wonder how the son would have been, would have operated after he came back from the dead. I wonder what tales he may have had to, to tell, and I wonder how he would have treated his mother thereafter. Um, those are some interesting points to consider, but the scripture does not say much about those things, so we have to believe that he, when he came back, he was an even better son than when he left. And of course, um, his uh, bringing back to life would have been quite different from the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ because, like Lazarus, at some point in the future, he was going to pass again, hopefully this time, long after his mother had passed. So we see that uh, scenario where Jesus is involved, and when Jesus becomes involved in a scenario, it can so enlighten and brighten up the situation. When we look at what transpired around the time too, those persons who had come and were grieving were suddenly changed by um, what they, when they saw Jesus and how he operated. When Jesus comes into one's life, when you are closely associated with him, when you have that connection, some interesting things happen. Have interesting things been happening to you as you connect to him? I hope so. And if not, um, I would suggest that you make that link and try it out for yourself. Because we see here um, a situation where it was dire, it was grim, it was sorrowful. We could almost feel what that lady possibly was feeling at the time. And then Jesus intervened and we see the magical transformation. Now she is happy. Now there is joy in her life and in her heart. Now there's a future for her to look out to. And furthermore, the scriptures indicated not just her, but those persons who had come to grieve and those persons who had come with Jesus Christ to see what was going on, they were all enlivened. So there you have it. A life linked to Jesus Christ, you can have these wonderful promises for it states, uh, this promise of promises in your life. But you know, uh, as preachers and listeners, we like to hear those wonderful things. But if you are listening in Romans, there's some other little things there we ought also to be aware of. Because it says here, for, for your sake, we are being killed all day long, and we are come to the sheep to be slaughtered. Now that part we don't like too much. That part we tend not to preach about. That part we tend not to vocalize when we are talking about the love of Christ and what he's doing for us. Uh, not a very pleasant prospect. But living a virtual life for him often requires sacrifice. It often requires focus. It often requires dedication. You know, whenever I attend a, f I attend a funeral, I listen out for the eulogy for it is for it often speaks to the virtual practices in life that are enduring. 
Those practices that are worthy of mention and those are highlighted. I, I know that you like to say, oh, there's always a good thing, but people, oh, sometimes when I hear this, I have to look back at the photograph in the front to see if that was really the same person or if I come to the wrong funeral because I really didn't know this person at all, where all these things come from. Um, but you know, it is, it is not, I have a help you if you come to the wrong one. Um, but you know that um, it is not our practice to talk about the negatives. And um, in, in, in people's lives, there are always positives. And this is the time to highlight the positive. Not to make the person who just passed look good, uh, make the wife feel smart, etc. But for you, the listeners, to understand what life is truly all about. Because um, uh, I, I've discovered that seldom are those who have passed praise for the material wealth they have accumulated, um, uh, but more so for how they use that wealth to help others. Seldom are they praised for good looks, for, for their good looks. Seldom are they praised for how much they could afford. All these attributes that we get so caught up with, and they look around now, and some of the people here dress real smart for true. Um, so but that's a good thing. But, but they said, you know what? Um, these uh, attributes that seem that we get caught up with in life that seem so large uh, during life no longer seem even worthy of a mention. Indeed, I have I have heard more accounts of lives lived by some of those who we may never have even given a second thought to or considered particularly successful in life. But when you hear of their accomplishments in their service to others, the lengths they would go to to assist, the lives they have touched, and the guidance they have, give, have given, you think, wow, this person really lived a life. I remember attending a funeral of a groundsman at a prominent school, foundation, of course, uh, and then, uh, there are others? Anyway, they spoke about his interaction with the students and the many he assisted financially, the many he mentored, adults who convened with him, organizations he belonged to, to whom he interacted with persons in various communities. And to this day, I have to say, I still remember that eulogy, but I long since forget the sermon. I suppose the same thing will happen here to me this morning. <laughs> but anyway, um, that is not a bad thing. Brothers and sisters, as I close, uh, we have heard the scriptures read assuring us of the love of God. And we have seen how when Jesus intervenes, the difference he can make in your life. I've asked you to try out for yourself if you have not already, but a lot of you look like if you're well versed in that area. The comparison, the compassion that Jesus had for that widow and for us, the promise from the book of Romans, I'm hoping that it will cause us, including me too, to perhaps reflect on our lives this morning, especially during this season when we celebrate God's great gift to us in the sacrifices of his only son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. I know that this is a time when Bajans will fill churches, not so much on all year's night, but certainly Christmas morning. So I'm expecting that Christ's message at that point will be well received. Brothers and sisters, my friends, family, let us use this time to reflect that love that Christ has shown us by pledging to lead the type of lifestyle that would be a perfect mirror image of our lives live for him. Amen? Amen. Amen. pause for a little moment for that to sink in and now we are going to stand and say together the Apostles Creed the Apostles Creed as indicated on your program I believe in God the Father Almighty creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. 
He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Don't sit down yet. You can stand and sing, Zine forever, God of love. Kindly be seated for the prayer of thanksgiving. Praise be to you, O God, our Father, who created us in your own image for eternal fellowship with you. Praise and thanksgiving to you, O Christ, our Lord, and our God, who have overcome the sharpness of death and opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers and are now seated at the right hand of God in the glory of the Father. Praise and blessing be to you, O Holy Spirit, God our Comforter, who bear witness within us of our acceptance with the Father and have become the pledge of our eternal inheritance. All praise and glory, blessing and honor, thanksgiving and worship be to you, O blessed Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. We bless your name for the life of him whom we today lay to rest. We give you thanks for the joy and the blessing his life has brought to others, for his service to his generation according to your will, and for every happy remembrance of his life. We bless you for your mercy and goodness, which have followed him all the days of his life, that now the trials of this world are over and death itself is past. Receive him into your perfect kingdom, 
and bring us with all who have lived and served you faithfully to the fullness of your eternal joy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I invite you to stand for the commendation. Eternal God, who have made us all and hate nothing that you have made, and have given your son for our redemption, we commend our brother Hartley MacDonald to your perfect mercy and wisdom. Eternal rest grant unto him, and let perpetual light shine upon him. Together we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn, through all the changing scenes of life,
receive the benediction. Now the God of peace, peace who brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, make you perfect in every good thing to do his will, working in you that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Let us prepare our hearts as we prepare to lay our brother to rest. We know that neither death nor life, nor things present nor things to come, nor height nor depth, nor any other creature can separate us from the love of God, which is in Jesus Christ our Lord. We know that if this earthly house of our tabernacle be dissolved, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Since our brother has departed out of this life, and Almighty God in his mercy has taken him to himself, we therefore commit his body to the ground, dust to dust, ashes to ashes, earth to earth, in sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, From henceforth, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Even so, says the Spirit, for they rest from their labors. Let us pray. Our merciful God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Father of mercies and God of all comfort, raise us up, we pray, from, death of, from the death of sin to a new life of righteousness, that when we shall depart this life, we shall be found acceptable in your sight. This we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Granted, we reave consolation and faith in this time of distress and trial, the blessed hope in the coming of your kingdom, the sustaining grace in the fellowship of your people, and steadfastness in the service of your name and the doing of your will, through so Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Support us, O Lord, all the day long from this troublous life until the shadows lengthen, the evening comes, the busy world is hush, the fever of life is over, and our work is done. Then, Lord, in your mercy, grant unto us safe lodging, holy rest, and peace at last, through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen.
The day thou givest, Lord, is ended. Let us sing this together. church on sleeping while earth rolls over into the light through all the world her watch is keeping and rest not now by day or night As o'er each continent and island, the dawn leads on another day. The voice of prayer is never silent, nor dies the stretch of praise away. The sun that bids us press his wicked or brethren neath the western sky and o'er by all fresh lips are making thy one trust do and search on high. So be it, Lord, thy throne shall never like earth's proud land pass pass away. Thy king stands and grows forever till all thy creatures own thy place. The next hymn is When We All Get to Heaven. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, We'll sing and shout the victory. While we walk the pilgrim pathway, clouds will overspread. 
But when traveling days are over, not a shadow, not a sign. When we all get to heaven, now the day of rejoicing that will be. All see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Let us then be true and faithful, trust in serving every day. Just one glimpse of him in glory will the toys of life repay. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Onward to the prize before us, in his beauty we'll behold. Soon the pearly gates will open, we shall tread the streets of gold. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Amen. Soon and very soon. Soon and very soon. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Hallelujah. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Hallelujah. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Oh, hallelujah. hallelujah, hallelujah, we're going to see the king. No more crying there. We are going to see the king. Hallelujah. No more crying there. We are going to see the king. Hallelujah. No more crying there. We are going to see the king. Oh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh. We're going to see the king. Oh. No more dying there. We are going to see the king. No more dying there. We are going to see the king. No more dying there. We are going to see the king. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to see the king. Soon and very soon. We are going to see the king. Soon and very soon. We are going to see the king. Hallelujah. Soon and very soon. We are going to see the king. Oh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to see the king. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are going to see the king. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to see the Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. We praise the Lord and we're going to praise him in song as we sing together to God be the glory. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. 
Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory. Great things he hath done. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood to every believer, the promise of God, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Great things he hath taught us, great things he hath done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our rapture, when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Now come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he hath Done. Praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son. And give him the glory, great things he hath done. Amen.
receive the benediction. Grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. I just want to thank all of you on behalf of our family. We just thank you for spending this precious moment with us. And I just want you to keep all of us in your prayers. And may God continue to richly bless each one of you. At this point, we just have um, the Ellerslie School that's represented here. They want to sing the, the school song, and it was composed with, by was it Auntie Yvonne, Yvonne Ford. Oh, Ellerslie, oh, Ellerslie, source of our light and education. Oh, Ellerslie, oh, Ellerslie, fount of our meek illumination. The hills beyond the coast of life encourage my soul and use of time. My neighboring factories of life. Scoping plenty for the plants to dry. Oh, Ellerslie, oh, Ellerslie, generous on my matter be nigh. Oh, Ellerslie, oh, Ellerslie, you not trend in build a mine. Sons and daughters in this station, We'll find it bright in this our nation, and torches be it used in light. Be compared to those who are so in right. Thank you.
Hello.